Good in yourself. Good to see you. Good, Good to, to see you too, Eric. Do you have a PowerPoint character? No, I'm just going to speak. Okay, great, great. I've got your, uh, I've got yeah, my brochure as, as a prop. So. Okay. Yeah, and we, so we, yeah. we distributed yeah. about you know 50 of those. Okay. So a lot of people should actually Good. have that. Sure. And then Gary, if it's okay, if you go to Karen and Jose, and we'll, we'll wrap up with you. Okay. Ivory, you want to do it? Hi, Karen. Good to meet you too. Pleasure to meet you. know a little bit, but not a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, good afternoon again, and uh, uh, congratulations again to Chris and Duncan for an outstanding conference. This just gets better uh, every year. This is my third uh, time around. Uh, and uh, what a range of topics we've had today. We've gone from the tremendous uh, macro vision uh, given to us in the morning by uh, all of the fantastic panelists that we had to kind of the nuts and bolts, the, the way the border actually works or does not work uh, here in the afternoon. And uh, I've been working on kind of business environment issues over the past uh, several months with Chris uh, uh, in our recent report, Competitive Border Communities, looking at mapping issues, mapping and developing transborder industries. So uh, it's a little ethereal, so it's good to get back to something uh, concrete, literally made of concrete, <laughs> as, uh, as, as, as ports of entry uh, are. Um, and uh, it's a fantastic uh, panel here today, a and Chris did a fantastic job of, of setting it up. We've got, we're first we'll start off with uh, Karen Sullivan uh, from State Department, who will give us kind of a macro view of how uh, this coordination is organized at the federal level. Uh, this is one of the most developed, this is maybe the most developed area of uh, bilateral coordination. I would say absolutely. Right, right. And then we'll, then we'll go into uh, uh, kind of, uh, I'm getting back to more uh, business environment uh, issues with Jose Antonio Vidales. We'll talk about uh, his work as a customs broker and as the head of an umbrella organization that deals with custom brokers organizations in Mexico, uh, which I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about. Thank and we'll wrap up with uh, Gary Gallegos, executive director of uh, an organization that's really doing state-of-the-art work uh, in San Diego, Tijuana, in putting together pretty much every kind of port of entry that you would want to put together. So uh, they've seen it all in San Diego, Tijuana over the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, lots and lots of interesting work. Gary's going to talk to us about uh, SR11, Otay Mesa East, a fascinating project that will begin construction. Uh, we'll have construction begin next year on this, That's I believe. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, you know, as I said, uh, it, Kind of, we've we've come full circle here since the morning, since Congressman O'Rourke talked about the emotional stories we have to tell about the U.S.-Mexico border, and I, I'm I'm absolutely with him on that. Uh, a fascinating talk by the congressman. Uh, but again, what's so great about ports of entry is that they're so unemotional, right? They're very very tangible. Uh, the two governments can can have a calm, uh, a fairly calm uh, <laughs> conversation, mostly calm conversation about. Uh, infrastructure and they're absolutely fascinating. The level of detail on these things is is mind-boggling. We only have an hour uh, to, to to get into this, so we can't get into too many levels of detail. 
Uh, but uh, to a point, <laughs> and I would say to a point, because if you've ever been to, I recently uh, had the had the uh, pleasure of attending a GSA community forum in San Isidro about the new pedestrian crossing there, and and the level of passion uh, uh, in the group there uh, about the about very small, what I would consider a small uh, yet not insignificant details about how these flows of pedestrians will work uh, was amazing. This poor GSA. A regional administrator just had abuse heaped upon him, and he, he handled it very, very calmly and uh, and professionally. So it's a uh, uh, this can stir uh, stir passions. I think just some uh, additional general comments here. I, I think the big question that we're looking at with panel this panel and panels like this is how and where do we construct ports of entry uh, to benefit the North American economy? And there are at least three enormous pressures that are pushing against each other. Uh, uh, constantly. And one of them uh, is local political organization. Uh, this is a strong force, believe me. These ports of entry do not happen without a tremendous amount of local political organization and political alignment of which California is uh, the supreme example right now. Just the political alignment in the congressional delegation, both senators on board over multiple years uh, is, uh, is really impressive. Um, the national interest. We actually have something called a national interest determination uh, in, in the presidential permitting process uh, where State Department or Division of State Department has to uh, analyze uh, the feasibility. It's environmental feasibility. It's heavily environmental uh, in, in content. Mm -hmm. uh, so at, at some point, the, state, the federal government has to stand back and say, okay, we acknowledge these local pressures. Uh, we have to kind of put this into uh, a macro view uh, and give a give an assessment of whether we go forward with this uh, or not. Uh, and also the funding environment uh, in Congress or in any of the three federal governments at any given time is is a huge uh, a factor in in the feasibility of that. There there are other factors, but just taking uh, those three. Uh, gives us just a fascinating uh, a topic, a very challenging area. And again, I would remind you that we have no national transportation plan in the United States. We have no, uh, and much less, a North American transportation plan, which we were promised uh, at the Toluca uh, North American Leaders Summit. So uh, it's not quite chaotic, <laughs> as Chris, Chris Wilson actually uh, put forth the idea this morning that uh, this is a North American model of integration. It's just very, very different from the European Union, and it does constitute uh, an alternative vision uh, of how to do that. Uh, so just some general comments at the beginning. Uh, we will start off uh, with uh, some remarks from Karen. Great. Take it away. Thank you, Eric. So um, currently I am the Special Advisor for Economic and Border Affairs in the Office of Mexican Affairs at the State Department. So I work on, so I get to see this from both perspectives, both from the infrastructure perspective and the economic perspective. So, um, and I have to say that, as you mentioned, Eric, this particular part of the U.S.-Mexico relationship, which is incredibly strong and vibrant and positive, despite all of the issues that people see, um, this particular piece really works very well. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Obviously, local interests, federal interests, um, the fact that, you know, the border region is such a strongly integrated economic region. I'm sure you've heard this statistic before, $1.5 billion, $1 billion a day in trade goes across the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, you know, states from as far as Michigan and, and, and um, Louisiana, far from the border, you know, rely on Mexico as a top export market. So obviously the border area, getting things in and out is very important to both sides. Um, you know, I think what we achieve on the border is a good uh, barometer for how things are going in our relationship. And I know that um, you had uh, CBP Commissioner Kurlikowski here, and he mentioned all the great infrastructure projects that we've you know, been able to inaugurate in the past year, which is huge. I mean, these are long-term projects. These are things that take you know, 10, 20 years to develop and build. And to have three very significant projects happen in one year is is amazing and I think it's a true testament to how well we work together um, so I think you know people are very concerned obviously with current infrastructure how's it working um, delays things like that but I mean I will 
say from the federal perspective, and we work very closely with not only the Mexican federal government, but also U.S. state and local officials. Um, we have a really strong, very organized process. It begins with what we call the BBBXG, which is the Binational Bridges and Border Crossings Group, which meets um, three times a year. We just had a meeting last month in Mexico City. Um, and we get down into the nitty gritty technical details of all of these infrastructure projects. And there's opportunities for state, local officials, for private project sponsors to come and present to the group. And it's a very, it's a very useful tool. I think we, we hear about what people really care about and why it's important. Um, with that, we also have on the very high policy level, the 21st Century Border Management Initiative, which is led by the Executive Steering Committee, which is, which is on the US side is led by the NSC and on the Mexican side by the foreign ministry. And we again had another meeting just recently <coughs> as well. And again, we go through, we do talk about ports of entry, but we talk about the bigger policy issues too, of like, how do we fund infrastructure in these difficult budget times? How do we work to get private funding? What other kind, what, you know, how are we planning out ports of entry and where we're gonna put them? Where is the need? Um, so we work, we do have a good working relationship. We also have the high level economic dialogue, which is led by Vice President Biden and by President Peña Nieto, which met in Mexico City in February. And the border is a huge component of that discussion. And we do have several projects that are things that we are, are projects we focus on at that very high level. Otay East is one of them. San Isidro is also one of them. And uh, Nogales Mariposa is another. And so there is, a, you know, the border is obviously very important to both sides and we work you know, we work on these issues at, at, a, at a variety of different levels, and, and we can, I think we continue to make good progress. Um, I think also as important, and it's probably already been mentioned, is true, is we're looking at new ways to make things more efficient. We have the customs pre-inspection pilots, which started this year, two already operational, one in Laredo, one in Mesa de Otay, and now a new one, hopefully at the end of the year, in San Jeronimo, Chihuahua. I think, and, you know, I think so far, Again, I'm not, this is a CBP's program, but I think so far people have been very happy with how the programs are working, and it's a new way to look at how we do business. Um, because I think, you know, at some point, we have to think about, you know, capacity and other things with the current land ports of entry. Um, and we also have trust, you know, the trusted traveler programs, which we're working on. Um, I think trusted traveler will be an issue we talk about at the Nalls coming up in June, uh, at the end of this month in, in Canada, um, as well as other border, you know, talking about border comp competitiveness and the border, both borders, as a part of that. So, really, I think it's important. I think again, we again want to stress like how closely we work with Mexico on these issues, and that you know we we do try very hard to to work together to try to make things happen so um you know i think that that in itself is made, has made a huge difference in how the infrastructure uh, process has worked over the last couple of years actually before we move on to jose antonio are there any instances of where this coordination could be better coordination could always be better <laughs> um but i think i think probably the biggest the biggest probably hurdle that we face is that, you know, we, we're two sovereign countries with two distinct processes. And sometimes those processes work together well, and sometimes they don't. And we recognize that. And so we try very hard, uh, both, you know, at all levels, state, local. I know the state and local folks work very closely with their counterparts across the border um, to, uh, on these issues and, and often come to us and say, we're together on this we need you to be here too. And, and so we try very hard, I think, to, to work through those two different processes and meet at the same place. One more question before we move on. Uh, we talked about this before the panel. The Border Prioritization Council at NSC, this is a fairly new process. This is a brand new talk process. to us a little bit about this sure. and what it is, what it's supposed to do? So um, just uh, in 2015, we began what's called the Border Crossing Infrastructure Prioritization Council, which is led by the National Security Council at the White House. And it's a, it's a meeting of all the U.S. agencies that have interest in the border infrastructure process. And it's a way for us to take hard data, traffic flows, trade, operational requirements, uh, presidential permit status, the priorities of our Mexican and Canadian counterparts, so we can try to develop uh, priorities uh, for the border, uh, for construction, that we can then use for the president's budget. So, you know, obviously you've heard funding is an issue on the federal level. We have a huge funding deficit right now uh, in, in that we need to, to actually meet our current infrastructure needs, much less plan for the future. So this is a way for us to get together on the U.S. federal level and 
try to come up with a with a number a good number that we can give the president can give to Congress so that we can get what we need. Um, so that process is still in you know working its way through, but I think it will be good because it will be a way for us to say then. Uh, not only to Congress, but also to Mexico and Canada. This is what is important to us in terms of construction. One more question, Karen. Sure. How does this all work with the border master plans? We do look at the border master plans as one of the things we, that's part of the data set um, that we're reviewing is looking at what the border master plans have said their priorities are. And so obviously that plays a very important part in how we are analyzing things. Fantastic. Uh, we'll come back to you with more questions, I'm sure. Uh, we've got a lot of subject uh, matter experts uh, in the audience. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for discussion. Uh, Jose Antonio. Thank you, Eric. Uh, my name is Jose Antonio Vidales. <coughs> I'm president of uh, CADEM. CADEM is the uh, National Confederation of Customs Brokers in Mexico. We group uh, the 900 customs brokers that operate in, in Mexico. I'd like to uh, thank the Mexico Institute Wilson Center for the invitation. We are uh, definitely proud sponsors of this conference, uh, and we certainly appreciate the invitation to be here with you and talk about the movement of cargo, not, uh, not necessarily people, but the cargo. And uh, what do we as customs, Mexican customs brokers, what is our role? How do, what do we do in, 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 in this uh, logistic chain, because we, we, we've talked about a lot about the infrastructure, about technology, but uh, we need to understand and know better what's the job of the uh, service providers that make the goods uh, move in and out of the, out of the countries and do it efficiently and in a competitive way. So uh, I'd like to start with some facts or uh, information about how that tells us about the importance of our trade relationship between the U.S. and Mexico. In Mexico, 64% of our GDP is related to international commerce, 64%. There's been some other uh, um, uh, issues about energy and all that that certainly will become very important in Mexico, but up to date, 64% uh, of, our, of our GDP is related to commerce. So that's, that tells us about the importance of that. And 80% uh, of our exports come to the U.S. 50% of the exports of the U.S. go to Mexico. So we can uh, also understand the importance of this uh, relationship between Mexico and the U.S. Um, Karen was also telling us, uh, reminding us of the uh, value of the, of the trade uh, between Mexico, $1,500,000,000 per day. And uh, Mexico is the second trade partner to the U.S. So with these numbers, we can understand that we need to work a lot together to find better opportunities and find ways to do our international trade in a faster and more secure and competitive way. What do we do as customs brokers in Mexico? We are the ones that bring the balance between facilitation and control. Because we have, we have a government that wants control. But we, we have clients, importers and exporters that want facilitation, that want the goods to move fast and, and cheaper between, uh, between our countries. So we bring those, that balance between uh, facilis facilitation and, and, and control. And we do it with expertise, we do it with knowledge, we do it with technology, with infrastructure between, uh, between our countries because as uh, Mexican customs workers and for those that know or, or are related to, to the uh, southern states in, in the U.S., uh, most of the uh, or some of the uh, uh, infrastructure built for logistic purposes in the southern states are, are owned by uh, Mexican customs brokers. So we also build infrastructure. We also give jobs, give jobs in, 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 the, in the U.S. Uh, what, what are we doing? Because we understand that we have, uh, we have to take advantage of, I've never seen, a better and most uh, or a better relationship between our governments between uh, Mexico and, and the U.S. than what's happening now. It's it's very it's very uh, straight. It's very uh, uh, tight. Uh, I don't know how to say it exactly, but it's I've, I've never seen it so so close. So we have to take advantage and understand that we as as private sector have have uh, our, our role to play. Because even if our governments want to do uh, a lot of things 
to uh, facilitate uh, international trade, there are some things they cannot do because they're, they're, they're public, they're, they're government. That's where we come in as private sectors. So what are we doing now? Uh, we have a great relationship with our equivalent uh, from CADEM in the U.S., which is, this, which is the NCBFAA. We just signed uh, an agreement with them in their annual conference in Tucson, Arizona. In fact, uh, Commissioner Kerlikowski was, was a uh, witness in, in, in the signing of that agreement. And that agreement, it's not only a paper to sign and, and you know, have a photograph and, uh, and do a lot of publicity with it. It's, a, it's an agreement that uh, sets, sets the uh, table to start uh, interchanging information, uh, start working on, 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 on mutual projects that are beneficial for, beneficial for both our, our, our countries. Um, we can we can share uh, the, the professionalization capacitation uh, uh, specific information how of how we do business in each of our countries and and what are the opportunities that we have uh, we have uh, we will sign an agreement with the customs broker association uh, of canada so and we've had we in the in the annual conference we had a panel that uh, between Canada, United States, and Mexico, I was sitting with, with Jeff Powell and, and Candice uh, from, from Canada, talking about all these. Uh, what's it, what are the difference, difference process, different uh, processes that we have in each our country? But basically, what are, what are the similar similarities that we have and the opportunities that we have to, m to, make, it, uh, to make it better? And uh, there's a lot of things that are happening and a lot of opportunities that are going on right now, and uh, we should take advantage. Uh, Commissioner Kerlikowski and, and Karen was, was talking about this uh, um, dual inspection or, or pre-clearance programs in, in, in the U.S. and Mexico, and uh, basically in, in Otay and, and Laredo. And I, and I, was, a, I was a witness there. I was, there in, I was in Tijuana, I was in Laredo when they opened it, and I just couldn't believe it. If you were to tell me five years ago that uh, I would be uh, standing in Tijuana in uh, the, the Mexican custom site, watching uh, U.S. officers, armed officers from CBP, alongside with the Mexican uh, officers, with Commissioner Kerlikowski, with our f finance uh, minister, you know, uh, with the, both our, our flags, and uh, with this pre-inspection program, I would say th that uh, we were crazy. Well, never, I would never uh, live to see that. Well, that's already happening. And it's already happening in Laredo, where you can see uh, Mexican customs broker agents in, in Laredo pre-inspecting goods. And that's, uh, they, they were asking Commissioner how, how important were those programs and what was the future. I think the, that, the, that, the main, that, the main, that the key here is what's next. Those are pilot programs, I understand. And we have to watch them carefully to, to see the results. But the thing is, how much time will it take to take us to start doing pre-clearance maybe in, in uh, Detroit, Dallas, Guanajuato, Mexico, some other parts? I mean, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a way to make it more competitive and, and, uh, and uh, avoid, avoid uh, hurting the cargo. Because if you, if, you, if you handle the cargo in one country and then you handle it again in another country, there's a risk of damaging products. So, so you make it more competitive and faster there's there's um, we're also talking about the regional single window uh, I think Commissioner also uh, Kerlikowski also mentioned that uh, Mexico has a single window yes we have a single window since uh, three years ago we started uh, way before uh, the, the US and, and Canada uh, we've had our zero <coughs> problems I, I understand but it's uh, I, I guess it's a <laughs> continuous uh, program uh, to, to, to make it better but what I see now is that uh, in the U.S. they have a presidential mandate to have the single window the, for international trade by December of this year. So they're working on it. I've, I've talked to our, our colleagues in, in, in the States, and they've, they have their, their, their share of problems also to build it. But the thing is, how much time do you think will take us to have a regional single window? I mean, if the U.S. has a single window by let's say by, by the beginning of next year, and Canada does also, and we have our own region, uh, single window, why don't we connect them? Why don't start, we start building horizontal information that maybe in some time 
we can have a continental single window for tr international trade. And maybe in the long term and uh, a worldwide uh, single window for international trade, it, it's logic. So why don't we start working on it, in, or working on it now? So, so part of this agreement is, is to work on, on the regional single window. In fact, Maria Luisa Boyce was here, and uh, we have a meeting with her tomorrow at 4.30 to talk about the regional single window. What do we have to do to be technologically and legally, to make it possible technologically and, lo and uh, legally wise? So that's a, that's, a nice, that's a good program <coughs> that we can share a lot of information and we can bring a lot of security because it's like, I see that as the, uh, the equivalent could be the, the global, the global uh, entry program for passengers. What do you do in the global entry uh, program? You register yourself, give a lot of information, the government checks you out, and if, I mean, if you don't represent any risk, then they give you the global card, and whenever you access the states, you go through another line because they know who you are, they know where you're coming from, they know who, where you're going. It has to be the same with cargo. We have, uh, we're working on, in Mexico with a uh, with, um, program, uh, to, uh, a strategic program, uh, a strategic plan to, uh, that, that's called 20, that goes all the way to 2030, where we have, where we want to have invisible customs, invisible for, for importers and exporters. And I don't mean invisible where we don't have any, any, infra any infrastructure. I mean, we're not going to disappear that. It's just that for whoever is certified, whoever doesn't represent any risk, whoever is doing, uh, you know, business legally uh, and selling products legally and uh, transporting with a company that's uh, certified, why do, you, why do you make them go to customs? <coughs> so, uh, obviously, you have to, gap, you have to uh, invest in infrastructure because uh, the movement of the cargo has to go through customs. But at least uh, you only use the, uh, the physical installations to check the, the cargo that represents risk. Otherwise, let it go. If you know who the client is and the exporter and the same product and the, and the, and the customs broker certified, let it go. So that's another thing that we're working on, and as, as well as the uh, AEO certification, which is equivalent to the CD pad. Uh, there's uh, uh, companies and exporters and importers in Mexico <coughs> are getting certified. As custom bro brokers, we are getting certified as AEOs. We, out of the 900 custom brokers in Mexico, there's about 50 actually certified, and we're working to at least uh, have uh, 300 or 400 of them by the end of our administration, which is in about a year or so, uh, and as, as a trusted uh, traded program. But what do we need to do now? We have CDPAD and we have NEC or AEO in Mexico. Well, we, have, we need to have mutual recognition because if each of our countries has their own program, but they don't, they don't, they're not linked and they're, they don't have mutual recognition, it, it doesn't work uh, as, as it should because they're going to stop you in the States or they're going to stop you in Mexico or not recognize uh, the certification in, in, in any of the countries. And obviously, we have to uh, give benefits. Since they're not uh, uh, mandatory, uh, you have to have benefits. Benefits in terms of a faster crossing, uh, a s a specific uh, lanes to cross when you're certified, which we don't have now, or at least not in, not in all the crossing points. We need to work on that. And um, we're also working on the CO dialogue. We have, in fact, here in, in Washington, today in the, uh, in the afternoon and tomorrow, we have the CO dialogue. And we have uh, a panel there at uh, around 11.30 where we're talking also about border optimization with the, I, in, in this level with the, with the CEOs of, of, of the companies and, and the government representation where we have what, what I'm going to talk there is about three uh, basic um, uh, areas where we're working. Uh, one of them is fast trade. And uh, to give an example of what we're looking there is that, that we want the, the cargo to cross in 30 minutes, back or forth, if you're certified, not more than 30 minutes. So what do we need to do to make it work? In terms of harmonized uh, trade, we have programs like the uh, uh, regional single window, or we, or we are proposing a, a portal, an international uh, portal. Users, when, when, when you want to send a good to Mexico or Canada, 
there's not much information or, or uh, regulations, legislation uh, of what to do in order to send your products to, to, to any of these countries. So we want to build a portal that uh, can give you um, information of what exactly you need to do to send goods to any of the countries, including legal, inform legal uh, information. And safe and secure trade. What do we need to do to make it safer? So as you can see, there's a lot of opportunities, uh, but uh, the, the, the time is there because uh, I see a, I've never seen a better relationship with both our governments, so we have to take advantage of it. And uh, but, uh, just to, to, to end uh, my, my, uh, my commentaries here as people think that uh, complying makes you less competitive. What we think is totally vice versa. What we think is if you comply, you're more competitive because your products can move faster uh, between uh, between uh, the countries, so that uh, that's uh, those are my comments. Yeah, thanks for that last point, which I think is a really good one. Uh, we've noted in our research that uh, the federal government has had a difficult time uh, getting shippers into uh, the CTPAD and FAST programs, um, and uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, some of the smaller folks uh, think it's just not worth the the expense to secure my supply chain. Uh, it's rather onerous. I'll take my chances in the normal lanes. Uh, but you're saying you're saying it's actually the opposite. So that's that's uh, very interesting to hear. Very uh, uh, complete remarks. Uh, there's a lot to jump to 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 work with there. We'll come back to you during the Great. question and answer period. Sure. Uh, Jose Antonio, thanks so much for your remarks. Uh, Gary, if you could take us through the entire through the process uh, that is SR uh, 11 Otay Mesa East, I think it would be uh, uh, fascinating to see how this works uh, on the ground. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having us today. Um, and as I'm really pleased to be able to share uh, sort of our story about why we're so excited about this border crossing that many, including ourselves, are calling the you know border crossing of the future. And I thought to try to tell our story, I try to frame it sort of around three questions. And you know, why are border crossings important to the San Diego region? You know, what have we done so far? And I think we've got a good story to tell that we've had a fair number of accomplishments. And then, you know, what do we see the, the challenges and opportunities lying ahead of us to, in essence, really close the deal? And so starting with, you know, why are border crossings important to regions like San Diego? And I'd like to start with trade opportunities. And Mexico continues to be, you know, California's largest trading partner. And California recently moved up from the eighth largest economy in the world to the sixth largest economy in the world. And one of the drivers for that, I believe, is you know, the trade that we've continued to see grow since the passage of NAFTA. So when we look at the California border crossings, uh, we see that you know, trade has grown by literally over 550%. Uh, so trade continues uh, to be a really strong part of the California economy, the economy that continues to grow and, and flourish. Uh, but we believe that because inadequate border uh, infrastructure in San Diego County, that the two countries are missing out in about $7 billion of economic opportunity. And when we take that down to the local level, we think that that number is at about $5 billion. So, you know, it's first about the economy. Secondly, Speaking the job opportunities that uh, our studies also tell us that this inadequate border infrastructure is costing the country, just because California's border crossings don't work, around 60,000 jobs annually. Uh, at the local level, that equates to about 51,000 jobs annually. And for us in San Diego, that's like adding four or five Qualcomms. And so many of you probably have a Qualcomm chip in your smartphone someplace that you're relying on today. And Qualcomm's uh, San Diego's largest private sector em employer. I know uh, I see Paola here uh, with the chamber. So, you know, the, the Qualcomm's an important part of the San Diego economy. And, you know, we could add four or five of those if we could just make this border crossing work better. And probably the most important of all is just the quality of life. And the fact that people are waiting two to three hours to cross the border, that's definitely uh, impacting our binational quality of life. Uh, and these wait times uh, are negatively impacting our environment as well, uh, causing negative health, panks, uh, health impacts to really what we would characterize as our most vulnerable and disadvantaged uh, communities. 
So, you know, quality of life's another driver as to why these border crossings are so important for us as a San Diego region. Uh, and quite frankly, more jobs would also help improve the economy and prosperity of our binational region. So with this in mind, uh, the region decided to play a way more proactive role in helping to improve border structure in a way that would help us take advantage of trading opportunities, uh, improve employment opportunities on both sides of the border, and really improve our, our environment. And so the region it, it recognizes and is thankful uh, to the federal government uh, for its effort to improve our existing border crossing, uh, San Ysidro probably being the best example of the world's busiest border crossings, and the improvements that the federal government has made there recently are, are definitely helping to meet our current needs. However, though, um, given the constraints, and you know, Karen talked a little bit about the fiscal constraints that the federal government uh, faces, uh, that you know, these are huge challenges for our federal government and our federal partners, and, and they're facing big challenges trying to keep up with just the existing border infrastructure that we have, San Ysidro being a primary example. And so we recognized that we sort of needed to look at a different approach uh, to address the growing need for border infrastructure at the regional level. Uh, so we turned to an approach that uh, has worked uh, very effectively for us in California, and it's what we call self-help, where we needed to play a more active role in not just asking for infrastructure from our federal government, but also looking for ways to pay for it and make it happen. And trying to help ourselves uh, is something that we think is pretty important. Uh, and we have some experience in doing that for almost 30 years, uh, San Diego has not only been planning transportation infrastructure in San Diego, but we've also been implementing projects. So we've got a fair amount of experience in not just talking the talk, but you know, really walking the walk. So with, with that as a background, I'd like to share with the group here what we've accomplished so far. And you, know, you asked Karen early on, you know, what could we improve about the process? And I wanna just give a shout out to the State Department because they have improved processes. And we started by seeking a federal presidential permit. And when we first started down this process, you know, you had to completely finish an environmental document to get a presidential permit. And so that means somebody had to invest not just hundreds of dollars, but millions of dollars to then ask the federal government, is, do we even have a chance for a presidential <laughs> permit? So, you know, that environment makes it really tough for somebody to pony up a bunch of money without even knowing whether you got a chance. And so we worked with the State Department I think it was the first project where it was really a provisional, uh, a, a provisional presidential permit where both countries said yes, but you got to do all the environmental work and make sure that you got all the important environmental pieces covered. I want to send a shout out to the State Department because they, they were willing to change their processes to accommodate some of the needs that we had. We've now completed all the environmental work and um, as somebody that's been building transportation infrastructure for 30 some years, starting to get really old here, but you know, just you know, the easiest thing we actually do at the end of the day is build projects. It's the, the environmental work, the right of way work, and all the other pre-building work that just is so hard. Uh, but in this project, we've got both NEPA, and in the case of California, we also have what we call CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which many will argue is tougher than the federal re requirements. So we've got both of them. So that's been a big accomplishment. Uh, I want to send out a shout out to my partner, Lori Berman uh, from Caltrans, because you know we do this in partnership and we've accomplished a lot of this stuff together. Uh, we sponsored state legislation that authorizes San Diego to impose, impose uh, user fees uh, for the use of SR11 and issue bonds for acquisition, construction, operations of this new border crossing. And this really is probably at the core of self-help. So we're figuring out how we're going to help ourselves and how we don't just come with our hand out to the federal government, but we got a way we think to pay for at least the capital infrastructure. Gary, just to jump in here, and this, this tolling will be shared with Mexico. Is that I'm gonna is cover that about that because okay. in partnership with Mexico, um, you know, it costs money to uh, collect tolls. There's inefficiencies in how many times you and where you collect. Uh, and we, in partnership with Mexico, are proposing a single collection with a revenue sharing operation that we think will make us more efficient, more effective. But I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, one other thing we did that probably government doesn't do very good. Government's good at spending money. It's not always good at making money and managing you know, money. And so since we know that this project has to go to market, because we're gonna have to sell bonds 
uh, that some investor is going to have to say, well, I'm, I'm willing to loan money. We hired a banker at the front end uh, to ensure that as we develop this project, that we've got a bankable project, a financially viable project. So Barclays Capital is our banker on this, uh, and we hired him at the front end. Uh, we've partnered with Mexico to uh, complete what we call an investment grade uh, traffic and revenue study. And another, I think, really important key innovation in the project we're proposing is a variable tolling concept. Uh, and this was not easy in working with our Mexican partners and convincing them that this works. And, and you know, we've done a little bit of this uh, in the past. Uh, but this tolling strategy includes that single toll you're talking about where we're going to share revenues with both sides to make the border work better. Um, Jose talked about a 30-minute goal. Well, we got a 20-minute goal to get people through the waiting to the line even faster, right, to get you to the front of the line, a 20-minute goal. <clears throat> and that's where variable tolls come in because we're going to raise and lower the price, and it'll go down, uh, and it'll serve as this traffic management tool that, if you know, really high-value products that have a really urgent need to get to market are probably more able and willing to pay a higher toll. So that how goes up and down, you know, make sure that the investment we've made is really a sustainable one with a very high level of service. And I want to note that uh, both Caltrans and Sandag have experience in this world. Uh, we've been value pricing on I-15 since 1996. Uh, as a way to manage tolls, we have the ability to vary the price every six minutes, and that helps us maintain our managed lanes so that they work at a very high level of service, not totally a brand new concept for us. Uh, but this tolling strategy then presents another opportunity in that, um, you know, we're now going to have to provide really accurate crossing times, not just for the new border crossing, but for the for the non-toll border crossings, because if someone's going to pay, it's got to be worth their time. And for them to understand whether it's worth their time, we need to understand well, you know, what happens at the other border crossings. And so in this regard, again, uh, and one of the themes here is partnerships. We can't get this done without partnerships. We've partnered with Mexico. We've developed an intelligent transportation framework that would be implemented with this project. And the benefits that we see to this approach is that this ITS framework that we've developed is now going to allow the border crossings to work as a system with real-time information for all users. So, so now, you know, and I would argue our border crossings today do not work as a system. They almost work as islands by themselves. Uh, and so we believe that, 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 that this will end up with efficiencies for all the border crossings, uh, thereby getting uh, a bigger bang uh, for the public investment that's being made. This should help reduce congestion at the borders. It should help improve our air quality and, again, improve our quality of life, returning to those themes of why this is important to us. So um, kind of trying to wrap up here, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead uh, to get this critical infrastructure done? And at the state and local level, we've invested about $250 million on the U.S. side, and we've completed the first phase of the road. It's actually open to traffic. This is the road that will lead to the new border crossing. SR11. SR11. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the process of designing the second phase, uh, which would totally complete the road, the entire road going to the new border crossing. Uh, we're in the process of acquiring 100 acres for the new port of entry. Uh, and we should note that this 100 acres, uh, we've supersized this, to borrow a McDonald's theme, I guess. <laughs> uh, and I don't know that there's uh, a border crossing anywhere on the, on the border where, you know, we've uh, we've allowed for this for this border crossing to be able to grow to meet not only our needs today, but be able to look 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe even 100 years into the future uh, and allow uh, this border crossing to grow. On the Mexican side, uh, again, you know, these things don't happen if we don't work together. Uh, they're proceeding with engineering and uh, for the project, and they recently obtained the resources to buy their, their right of way, which is, I think, a very critical move. And I want to, uh, you know, really thank the Mexicans and, and highlight, you know, the success that they're having. Uh, through the work of the high economic dialogue between the two countries, the new POE has been highlighted as this border crossing of the future and also a paradigm for national planning. Uh, the project has also been identified as a top priority. Uh, currently, CVP and STAT are having discussions about how to jointly 
uh, understand how this facility would work as a, as a joint facility. We think that this offers a great potential to implement uh, transportation innovations, which we've had success in other parts of our transportation system. Uh, and by that, I mean we're, we're looking at now, can you take some of these lanes, the arteries that go into this very critical border crossing, and make them possibly interchangeable? And by that, we mean that, you know, certain times of the day, um, if there's a higher demand for cargo, we might be able to use some of those lanes for cargo, but maybe other times of the day, we have more demand for passengers, so we can interchange how we use the lanes. Uh, we're working to figure out with these innovations, can we make these reversible? Uh, we've got a fair amount of experience in our transportation to doing that so that, you know, we know, for example, on the cargo side that a few months before Christmas, there's a huge demand to get products from Mexico to the market. So, you know, maybe we need to reverse some of those so that certain times of the year, we need more capacity coming northbound, maybe less capacity going southbound. Mm -hmm. And these are innovations that I would uh, suggest that no other uh, border crossing today uh, has in place, and we're trying to figure that out. Uh, Caltrans and Sandag are currently in the process of putting a professional team together of designers and uh, to cost and, and, and start to map out the, the ideas that are coming out of the SAT CVP group so that we can understand exactly how they work. And so again, we're being a, a partner here where we're not just saying, hey, you figure it out. We're bringing people to the team uh, to help figure that out. So in conclusion, uh, let me conclude by, by saying that both uh, Sandag and Caltrans are delighted to have this opportunity to you know, sh help shape the future of our dynamic binational region. And I really want to thank the Wilson Center and for, for inviting us today. And, Manat Jones, who is actually helping us on the projects. We recently retained Michael and Manat to help us uh, 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 navigate through the project and you know, make sure that these innovations don't get lost and we actually make them happen. And the Border Trade Alliance for the opportunity to present on our project. But if I sound excited, it's because I am excited. It's a lot of moving parts <laughs> in San Diego. It's really, thanks, thanks so much, Gary. Uh, it, it's definitely worth a visit if you haven't been out to uh, sunny, uh, any part of the San Diego, uh, uh, Tijuana, Otay Mesa border region. There is so much going on. Gary just presented on one project uh, right now, and that's, that's actually coming up. Um, you're, you're wrapping up the planning phase of that project, but you've got way out west, you've got the Pedestrian West facility that will open on July 15th. Uh, that's a new facility at uh, Virginia Avenue that uh, it's northbound only for the time being. Mm -hmm. uh, is that correct? Uh, you've got uh, the San Isidro, the, the passenger vehicle lanes, uh, that, that renovation, that... The cross-border terminal that was talked about earlier this morning. Cross-border CBX, uh, which is an absolutely beautiful facility. Um, and you've got an upcoming uh, partial, uh, well, the renovation slash demolition of the existing uh, pedestrian facility, which is at the end, I can, I can assure you, I crossed there uh, about two weeks ago, at the end of its useful life. Uh, and uh, I, uh, you know, normally I like uh, uh, historical buildings and that kind of thing, but I, I, will, I won't be sad uh, to see that pedestrian crossing go. Um, one thing, uh, before we open it up for, for questions, just if you wanted to touch base a little bit, Karen or Gary, on the pedestrian environment. In the morning, we just touched on this issue uh, a little bit. Historically, this has been the last priority or, or the least of the priorities in terms of planning. You've got commercial, mm -hmm. uh, which has, uh, thank goodness, which has uh, 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 big interest groups uh, uh, behind it. You've got the passenger vehicle uh, um, uh, zones, which have uh, lots and lots of cars and, and angry uh, drivers uh, behind them. And then you have these pedestrian environments where people cross on foot uh, to go shopping or to catch transit going someplace else uh, you know looking at San Isidro is not alone in this I mean none of them are in uh, are very advanced in terms of their infrastructure they are uh, a really really basic uh, infrastructure right now where is the thinking uh, on this uh, and where are uh, what, what are the governments thinking in terms of design changes uh, ways to make these more livable and, and increase people's quality of life I'll go first I guess um, 
I think, you know, we recognize certainly that, you know, while, like you said, commercial and, and, and vehicular traffic obviously is, is, is important, there is that pedestrian component that's equally important to both of our economies. And I think, I mean, having been through San Isidro, it, 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 you know, it's very important that that facility work. And I think, you know, this obviously we think San Isidro is important. We're spending $741 million to renovate that port of entry. And, and the biggest piece, one of the biggest pieces is the Ped West facility and the new facility on the, on the east side. So, um, you know, I think slowly but surely we've, we've gotten, we've, we've figured out that this is equally important. And I think certainly in terms of other existing ports of entry, that's something we're looking at. Um, you know, obviously as you, there's a huge, there's a huge federal deficit in terms of spending. I mean, we're talking about $5 billion that we are we need just to, to meet current needs, not even thinking about future planning. And so um, I, we have to look very carefully, you know, at what we have what need, and what is what really needs to be fixed first. Um, but I think the pedestrian piece is obviously still is very important, like you said, and we're slowly starting to, to, to make those facilities much better. Um, we heard from recently from folks from Arizona about how important pedestrian traffic is for them in terms of shopping and, and, and economic growth and opportunity. So we hear it. And so certainly we will continue to work with, with both Mexico and, and other project sponsors and local governments on, on, on that piece. Great. Um, why don't we open it up for questions uh, uh, from the audience? As I said, we have many, many uh, subject matter experts uh, with us today. Any questions? Gentleman in the back. Um, when thinking about the border and cross border. If you could identify yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Steven Zonizer. I work at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, during the presentation, which I really much enjoyed, I was thinking back to the late Robert Pastor, who would talk about uh, the differences in trucking regulations and truck weight limits in the three NAFTA countries as being a source of border congestion because it motivates the uh, unloading and loading of trucks in order to take advantage of the different regulatory environments. So I wanted to ask, uh, to what extent is this uh, a, an untapped opportunity to make the border more fluid. I I could try. Uh, we've <laughs> look. Uh, one of the real challenges is you know the road systems are designed for certain what we call easel loading. So I'm trying to get techie as an engineer here. <coughs> and so that's always been a big challenge. So the idea has been to educate the shippers and movers through weigh in motion scales and other ways uh, to make sure that they're compliant with you know the, the limits that exist. And I think in the case of California, it's, it will always be really difficult to ha allow heavier loads or longer trucks because of the weight and you know the impact that that would have on a very, very important investment that the public's made. But that said, I think we can work uh, with shippers and, and truckers and other folks and provide, you know, weigh in motion scale information uh, that I think, you know, when people understand what the rules are, then, you know, they'll, 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 they'll try and play by those rules. And California sort of led the effort right after NAFTA. Um, and I should have given a shout out, by the way, to our, our governor, who has been tremendously supportive of a lot of the stuff we've been doing on the border. But... Right after NAFTA passed, as an example, we built commercial inspection facilities on the border that many thought were, why are we doing these? And they, you know, become state-of-the-art facilities where the people that cross the border at OTI, you know, they understand the rules. They know they're going to go over a set of scales. And the f number of trucks that get unloaded because they're too heavy are probably really small. Actually, the, if you look at the out of compliance ratio at OTI, in many cases, it's better than other scale houses we have throughout California. So, uh, I mean, I think there's ways to try to make things better without, you know, it's always going to be very difficult to just allow heavier loads because of the impact to the roads. Uh, yeah, I'd like to comment on that also. In uh, this, uh, weight regulation thing. It's part of the uh, conversations that we're having at the CO dialogue. 
because it's definitely something that we have to work on because it, it not only uh, s uh, makes uh, uh, crossing slow, but it's also costing uh, money and, and it's not making it competitive and it's going on the other direction that we want to go. So it's something that, that's been discussed in the uh, CEO dialogue. Also uh, to make a, a faster crossing, not only the weight limitations, but secure lanes. We need to build secure lanes where certified products or, or products that are pre-cleared in, in Mexico or the U.S. can cross uh, through those secure lanes and, and uh, they can cross faster. Uh Piggybacking on that question, actually, you just mentioned secure lanes um, for products. Are you also is Karem and the other associations or partner associations also working on um, sort of the trusted shipper program that we're also working on in the dialogue? And along with that, I'm wondering if Karem and the associations are engaging more in similarly encouraging automation, um, greater you know involvement of risk assessment software into the trading process to facilitate that movement. Yeah, we definitely are. T the only way you can make uh, customs more uh, efficient, more transparent, and uh, are through technology. Uh, so we are we in the process of uh, building uh, or creating the, uh, or liberating more, uh, to, to better say it, the uh, our single window uh, version 2.0. And uh, and the all all of the automatization of the entrance and and uh, and exit of the of the cargo that's moved in customs. So yeah, technology is uh, is necessary to make it to make it more competitive and faster. We time for one more question from the audience. <coughs> Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to address you all. You identify yourself. Miguel Laguerre, Border Fusion Group. Uh, boy, there's a whole lot that was said here that's exciting about the new systems and techniques at OTI2 that could have application system-wide. Uh, you know, and, and the comment on we're now starting to look at the pedestrian. And what I meant to ask uh, earlier of uh, Commissioner Gerlachowski is, you know, from a security standpoint, certainly pedestrians are a safer risk for inspection than our vehicles or certainly trucks. And from an environmental impact, certainly pedestrians are safer for the environment than vehicles. 75 million vehicles last year uh, compared to 5.5 million trucks northbound. Uh, so it, it's the, the public policies though, however, that deal with the pedestrian e either crossing through the federal port or in the city, as you uh, mentioned earlier, Eric, leaves much to be desired. The pedestrian seems to be the one that really is lacking the attention uh, and really is worth the opportunity to deepen this relationship. I come to these meetings and you know it's always inspiring and I, and I see the, the real effort to deepen this relationship between the two countries. Well, I, it's, it's in the pedestrian for me as a 30-year stakeholder there in San Isidro. So what, what more focus could we put on policies that, that support this pedestrian mobility uh, in the years to come? Because three new ports of entry, pedestrian exclusive, CBX, Virginia Avenue, and now Petties, is, is pretty exciting. And what opportunity. And for efficient destination crossings as part of a system, that's all very exciting. But we need the proper policy and focus on this pedestrian. And I can tell you firsthand that we're, we're getting creamed in our communities because of the, the wrong policies. Thank you. Th thanks very much, Miguel, for your comments. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Uh, Congressman Hurd is here for uh, the final panel uh, of the day. Please join me in thanking our uh, excellent panelists. Thank you. Thank you. So once more, we're moving quickly into the, the next panel, so just uh, hold your spots, and we'll be back up online in just one second.